Today we are meeting with Maxime Forest from Sciences Po, yeah? Yes, correct. Uh, Sciences Po Paris uh, to discuss the topic is actually modernism guilty? Question. And moreover, uh, another point that I want to focus on that Maxime is one of the members and one of the leaders of collective Cité Radius uh, in Unité d'Habitation. And of course, that is one of the most iconic buildings of modernism era. And as I remember, uh, that building is listed in UNESCO World uh, Heritage List. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us in the project Ukrainian Constructivism that is supported by Ukrainian Foundation, Cultural Foundation. And uh, I hope today we will discuss a lot of very controversial topics on modernism. My first question is somehow connected with uh, my previous discussion with Owen Hezerly from London. And I told him small story, small story from my experience. You know that in Soviet, the Soviet Union, it was a lot of socialist cities. We called them Sotsgorod. And we have the same Sotsgorod in Kharkiv, Sotsgorod New Kharkiv. Uh, it was built near Kharkiv tractor factory. And now, of course, it's a bit, how to say, a bit bad district. Because it's really has a lot of troubles with economics, first of all, and maybe social problems. And I remember that I guided a free tour for children from a local school in that uh, Kharkiv Tractor Factory district. And uh, we uh, just uh, uh, stood near huge dormitory, huge awful dormitory, and the children asked me, one, one boy actually asked me, who is guilty, architects or people? And it's like 10 years ago, it was 10 years ago, but I still remember that phrase, that child's question. So I want to address the same question to you. What do you think? Who is actually to blame? Who is guilty? <laughs> Well, I think that's a good question. And as for me, the, the answer is rather clear. Neither of the two, neither the <laughs> architects nor the people who lived in, the, in such places, in such dormitories. Um, in this particular case, and I know a bit this, this place because I, I had this chance to visit it, to visit it in, in Kharkiv. Um, uh, and in this case, uh, I would say, because the answer would be different for, for each context and each country, but I would say that first, um, it is the Soviet Union, which is to be blamed in this case, or let's say state socialism, if we refer to Central Eastern Europe uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, it is um, state socialism and the Soviet Union, more specifically, uh, which failed. What, what do I mean by that? I mean that um, social, political, um, economical condition in which most of these large states were built, uh, were inhabited, were maintained, uh, were conditioned by this political experience. And, uh, and therefore, they were, for instance, uh, not in Kharkiv, but in other places associated with forced displacement of population uh, inside the country, uh, with internal colonization, uh, like, as for instance, in Central Asia or uh, Asian Republic or in the Baltic countries or the Baltic Socialist Republic. Um, and uh, all this had necessarily an impact on architecture, uh, on planning, but mostly on the way people lived in those places, how they felt related or not to it, how long it took for them to uh, put their roots uh, into these territories where many, uh, very often they were not born, uh, they did not come from, or they were educated in, in rural areas and they moved to large estate in cities. So I think that, yeah, social, social, economical, political, historical condition of production of such dormitories, as you said, uh, or estates are uh, those which can be eventually blamed for their current condition or the way they are, they are perceived. Something I would like to say as well in relation to that question is that uh, modernist principles uh, were only truly, um, were truly implemented only in a few 
of those many many estates and 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 uh, and um, urban utopias and uh, large planning project that were built over um, between the 30s and uh, and the late 1980s. Um, I mean, from Narkomfim built in 28, I think, uh, to Ladzinai, Ladzinai in Vilnius, which was built in the 80s. I mean, you have nearly all the period of the Soviet Union. And over this period, uh, you had a few places uh, where modernist principles were somehow implemented. Uh, and many others where they were not implemented. And again, the socio-political historical condition matter. Uh, if you look at the 1980s in, uh, in the Baltics, uh, there, was, there was all this renaissance um, of national culture, and uh, there were more room for maneuver for local architect uh, to, to operate, and their specific expertise had been recognized also at, uh, at the Soviet level as uh, specific and, uh, and, uh, and, and worth looking at and getting inspiration, hence the Lenin Prize. Um, and obviously that was not repeatable, that was specific to that particular area, to that particular period, just as Narkomfim and Ginsburg project in Moscow was specific to the mid uh, 1920s. And, uh, and, to, uh, and to the influence also of the context of the NAP policy and, and all of that. So basically, it, it depends on, on history. And of course, it is only not only state socialism, which is to blame, it's also post-communism. And uh, the new values, it broke uh, the harsh economical condition, especially for Ukraine, um, the, 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 the new challenges for population that makes those places especially difficult to inhabit during these periods, most certainly. And uh, I also imagine that uh, a new, a fully new system of value connected to consumerism, to individuality, um, which was promoted and logically spreading at the time, um, kind of let's further fade away is the star of this, uh, of this uh, momentum of this type of housing estate. But certainly that was not the end of the story. That was just maybe a beginning. Yeah, and another thing maybe from current days, uh, there is a problem that uh, such trouble houses where, you know, conditions of living is really awful in that building because on one floor is just one toilet and one kitchen, that's all. So people should live in really very bad conditions. But the problem is that I think our local administration or, for example, even government in general, they don't actually want to see that people and their problems and that people have no access to explain their problems. So it's just like, I don't know, a loophole in which people somehow were put in and uh, they trouble their problems, nobody wants to see them. And I, I think that is the problem of visibility of, of, of that group. Certainly, but also when from what you say, I see the big distance that you have with modernist principle in architecture. I mean, modernist <laughs> principles were uh, really about solving this type of issue, uh, you know, about uh, sanitization, uh, about having access to a modern comfort for all in an affordable way, uh, about providing uh, facilities for people to socialize uh, inside the buildings and uh, also to have private part, and that was not specific to uh, uh, the movement uh, uh, of uh, modern architects of Le Corbusier, but that was also also promoted by the Bauhaus and uh, also in constructivist principle, you, you had that. So it's, um, um, again, the distance between realization and uh, principle is huge in many of those places. It is less in a few of them as those I have mentioned, because there, indeed, there were means, uh, there were enough autonomy left to the architect to actually deliver something which is uh, making possibly life better. But in many, many cases, the reproduction of blocks, of dormitories, the poor uh, sanitary fac uh, faci uh, facilities um, was more linked to the political condition, the one of the past and the one of nowadays, the invisibility of people, as you said, of some community, um, then to modernism itself, because modernism was 
as far as I, you know, I don't know much about the opposite. <laughs> yeah, great. I, I, I agree. Uh, and and maybe uh, continuing the discussion, uh, I would say that when I grew up and, uh, for example, when I studied at university, uh, we all were somehow involved in discussion, postmodernist actually, discussion about critics of modernist architecture. Because when we studied, everybody said that modernism is actually guilty. And uh, that cliché about prut ego, everybody repeats that. All the time, everybody said that uh, modernism failed because proved I go. And, uh, you know, when you grown up in the Kharkiv Tractor Factory District, I'm actually from that district, I'm from community, uh, it was like, you know, you felt that you blamed too, that you, ha you have that uh, stamp on you that you are from bad district. And you start thinking that you are from proved I go, you are from ghetto or something like that. And it's not very good for, for, for community, first of all. But another thing, I think that there is some problem even in that blaming modernism and especially talking about communities and uh, living conditions, because it's really a deeply social question. And when we just find, you know, that uh, some style is guilt, I'm not sure that discussion is going right. What do you think about all that criticism of late 80s, 60s, and so on, and what it actually cost in 2000s, for example? For me, it really links up to the previous question, actually, mm -hmm. of, uh, of indeed who is, who is guilty and how we place the blame on architect, on the style, as you said, uh, or on social political condition. And I will very much, because certainly I'm a political scientist by training, so I tend to blame politics usually. <laughs> and here I will do it again. I mean, the example of pre uh, is a good one. In this case, it's not state socialism. Um, or Soviet Union, which failed. It's the, the U.S. society, uh, which uh, failed uh, to um, uh, to uh, solve uh, segregation, racial segregation issues, and social segregation issues, which failed also to uh, consistently uh, uh, invest in uh, social projects in the architectural sense of the term. I mean, in a social housing estate. Um, I mean, there is this big controversial and problematic relation of US uh, re uh, state, federal and municipal government to housing estate, to projects. Um, projects had always a bad connotation in the US of socialization, of impoverishment and of racial segregation. They were built nearly from the beginning as ghettos. So they failed, but what failed, it was not the architect in this case, uh, which was uh, originally not from the US, by the way, but it's, uh, it's actually the, the, the government and the overall relation of this country, the US, uh, to poverty and to racial problems. Um, and if I take them not to blame the Soviet Union and, and the US only, but my own country, France, uh, in France, um, um, projects built uh, uh, following that one, the one from which I speak, uh, the housing unit of Le Corbusier, which is one of the four built in France, plus the one in Berlin, uh, between the early 50s at that one in Marseille and uh, the late 60s as the one in Firmini near Lyon. But from that period, uh, thousands and thousands of large uh, prefabricated blocks were built across the territory to house first repatriated population from uh, former French colonies as from 1957 uh, and massively from 62 with the independence of Algeria, million of people poured onto the French territory and were first uh, located in those places. And when they manage a way to move in individual houses or smaller housing estates and private housing, then migrants from the same region came to fill in the French factories. And there was always this association and bad connotation of those uh, estates uh, related to population displacement and migration and post-coloniality. And the site, the stance that we have in France towards those places, which are in peripheral urban areas, has always been framed through that 
framing through that lens of postcoloniality. Uh, hence, they were never considered possibly as good places to live. So where is the, the, the guilt of the architect uh, into that? Certainly, there are architectural failure. Of course, there are. But in most cases, the blame is to be put on um, unsolved social problematics um, and on uh, governmental, um, strict, um, like governance structure and, and ways of doing things. It's very different in the US racial issues, um, very individualistic society built uh, on the model of, uh, of you know, the, the, the single family house um, in Soviet Union uh, with a, a totalitarian state, uh, then an authoritarian state, um, um, displacing people <laughs> and nation across the territories for decades um, and organizing starvation or shortages in France and postcolonialities. These are very different contexts, but everywhere as we speak, we understand that the guilt, uh, it, the scene is the one of the society itself. It's not the scene of the people who live in it, and it's not the scene of the architectural style either. And a good example of that, actually, is that when you solve the living condition question, I mean, in France, we had like huge money poured into rehabilita rehabilitating or destroying estates. So the biggest, um, like most failed ones were taking, taken down and they keep being taken down, like just exploded, um, creating a sense of loss among the people who lived in there, by the way. People regret them once they are done. Uh, but most, in most cases, the smaller one or medium-sized one, they are rehabilitated. They are properly isolated. They are painted, frame, like interior is changed. Uh, sound isolation is improved. Uh, a lot of greenery is put around. New services are created. And progressively, the population also changed. There is a gentle movement of gentrification being operated. But mixed city is kept, and the perception we have of those places remains the same. And uh, the situation, social condition in those estates that have been fully rehabilitated and uh, does not evolve much. So again, is that really about architecture? <laughs> <laughs> and the return into Le Corbusier, and maybe even to Unité d'Habitation. Uh, my question will be about um, about iconic iconic figures, iconic characters in our history of architecture. First of all, of course, Le Corbusier, because if you think about modernist first, you will remember Le Corbusier. It's like the same connection. Uh, but uh, why I want to talk about that, our main character in a uh, stage that we will produce in our multimedia project, uh, Ukrainian Constructivism, it will be the personality of Lotta Stambese, one of the first architects from Bauhaus, female architects, and uh, she lived in Kharkiv for two years, in 1932-1933. It's a very dramatic period for Ukraine, because it was a period of Goldamore. And first five-year plans, uh, Stalinist uh, five-year plans, uh, that was actually really very difficult for Ukrainians. But talking about Lotta Stambese, usually in any even academical communities, I found that her, um, her personality, her impact to architecture is somehow in shade of male figure of Hannes Meyer. And the question will be, like, what do you think about such building, constructing such huge figures of some star architects? The same like Le Corbusier, you can find, for example, ex explanation that he is someone like architect psychopath or architect modernist, maybe the main modernist of the world, in such mm -hmm. contradiction. What we lost behind that? I will start uh, to answer by an anecdote like you did at the beginning, a recent one. Um, I was staying like 
facilitating an exhibition here at Le Corbusier Housing Unit. And we received, it's one of the most visited modernist uh, building in, in, in Europe, and probably in the world. We have over 70,000 visitors and many of them architects. Uh, we have different relation to the historical figure of Le Corbusier and they come nevertheless here. And uh, earlier this year, I was standing here during the day, a hot day of summer, and uh, two uh, uh, young student, uh, female student from Germany came um, and we had a, a brief talk and, uh, um, and, and they were like really immediately very critical about Le Corbusier considering he was a fascist figure, period. And then therefore what he had done was to throw away and uh, that uh, he, his, his, uh, he, yeah, his character, his concepts were mainly to be framed through a political lens in the possible relation he had to fascism. So we had a long discussion because I tried first to, I'm not a fan of Le Corbusier. I'm um, a particular scientist, but I'm also a gender scholar. So I'm working very much on the gender dimension of politics, of avant-garde, also in Eastern Europe, as you know, and, um, and also on the gender dimension of architecture, which is the topic I'm teaching about. So I, I try to be like moderate, moderate and, uh, and, 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 uh, and really, um, yeah, complex in the approach and trying to convince them that the problem is precisely when we uh, connect architecture to a tutelar God-style figure, we miss the point. Uh, we miss the point because architecture is a complex thing and, you know, and, and urban planning is a complex thing. And uh, when it is just a political uh, a manifesto, then it is Albert Speer, basically. Then it is a column with a Svatiska on the top of it, and that's not architecture. So uh, usually when you have like complex um, projects that are built, uh, they are, there is not only ideology in it, neither at Narkomfim by Ginsburg with constructivism, neither here at housing unit. So I, I would recommend to, to kind of um, approach architecture, not through the dominant figure of one or another, usually male, uh, uh, architect, but truly what is also needed is to challenge this androcentric figure, this androcentric male-centered conception of architecture with uh, the image that is also maintained by many people about architects, that architects are in full control. Some architects are also, also nowadays um, trying to very much to maintain this illusion, but that's not true. And probably it has never been true. Architects have always had, they were never operating alone. Uh, they, has all, had, they had always to negotiate a lot. And usually you see the print, the, 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 the proof of their negotiation in the very building, often in a negative way. Um, so they are, they are not only in charge. If I look up at the building I work and live in, this is not a building by Le Corbusier. It's a building by Le Corbusier, by Charlotte Perrion, by Jean Prouvé, by Fernand Boucobza, who was a local uh, architect from Marseille with, uh, I think, Lebanese or uh, oh, no, uh, Jewish-Tunisian origin. Um, it's a building by uh, um, Yanis Xenakis, who was an architect, a Greek partisan and a mathematician. Um, it's a building by um, uh, Andrzej uh, Wogensky, uh, who was originally from Poland and who was a long time, uh, um, um, you know, right hand of Le Corbusier in his studio. So it's a teamwork. And uh, we are living in a flat which was integrally designed by Charlotte Perriand, by a woman who designed the first open kitchen, uh, the first American style kitchen uh, of, uh, of history of design and architecture. So um, it proved that it is not uh, one person's story, it is never, especially when we talk about large project. And um, anyway, this uh, figure of the God style architect that control everything is I think very much of an illusion. So it um, doesn't mean that we don't have to look at the political pedigree of the architect in a critical way, that we cannot also add, uh, look at their gender record. Uh, you know, Le Corbusier was definitely a male chauvinist. 
Um, but it was probably not the worst one. <laughs> it was pretty, um, pretty equal in the way he treated both men and women. That is badly. <laughs> And uh, again, talking about uh, female representation in architecture and history of architecture, I start thinking about UNESCO Heritage List. You know, we have, I don't know, not so much objects from modernist era made by women in list. Actually, not one even, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think that is a huge problem. I, I think that we should think about that and maybe we all like world society we miss something because if we look to that list, all the objects they made by men mm -hmm. and no women architecture. What do you think about that? No, first that's true. Uh, we, we, we also should consider that modernist building uh, also from the interwar period were not listed neither nationally nor internationally until very recently, that uh, uh, the um, um, work of Le Corbusier himself uh, was listed uh, after several uh, failed attempt to list it, uh, because there was no not sufficient like recognition and understanding of the value of this architecture from the side of, from the side of uh, architecture conservators worldwide. And I'm not sure that if the latest um, attempt had not taken place during uh, the uh, military coup attempt in Turkey in 2016 in Istanbul, it would have actually passed. Mm -hmm. You know, every, everyone was uh, rushing to the airport to escape from Istanbul. So maybe it was a reason why the decision was unanimous this time and like the other time. So it's very recent, this recognition. Uh, and obviously it is very marked, even marked by this patriarchal culture of our architecture and heritage conservation with the Matilda effect, we call it in science, which is a systematic invisibilization of the contribution of women, which in this case is particularly problematic because they are there, <laughs> because they are present. They were present quite significantly at Bauhaus. Uh, and as you mentioned about Hannes Meyer, they were often in the shadow of their partner, husband, collaborator, who was male, applying to many of them. Uh, but there were also uh, women involved uh, in, arch in modernist architecture movement in, uh, in, uh, in France and in, uh, in Latin America, in the US. So um, yeah, definitely this acknowledgement is uh, needed. And uh, it will be also a way to challenge this patriarchal um, architect-centered vision of architecture, uh, looking at the condition of production of architecture, the power relation they reveal, who is actually involved, how it relates to community, and also how you live in there. And, uh, you know, I was mentioning Charlotte Perriand because now her role is really truly recognized in France and she's definitely no longer in the shadow of Le Corbusier. She will have her own museum before him. She had her large retrospective at Louis Vuitton Foundation in Paris before any for Le Corbusier. So she's definitely uh, a star. And, uh, and when you live in a, in a place designed uh, in a known male-centered way, you can feel the difference uh, in, in, uh, in, in what was brought forward. Um, not, you know, in a cliche side, there is no feminine architecture. This is definitely not what I, I'm implying. Uh, but there, there, there are architects that can be male or female who escape to the illusionary perspective of the architect god of the Olympia building is monument uh, and who care about design, about usages, about people, all kinds of people who live in it. And I think this is also what we need in modern contemporary architecture. And that's, you know, we mentioned modernism, but what about postmodernism? Earlier you said that many critiques of modernism came from postmodernism. Look at this horrible, completely detached from context architecture. Um, look at this standardization. Uh, but postmodernism was a terrible period. And when I look at Kiev 
or Kharkiv, I can see the print, especially in Kiev, to be honest, of this postmodernist architecture and how much damage it did and how much it put this, again, phallocratic vision of the city uh, with, uh, with skyscrapers, with uh, a lot of glass, with all those kitschy details and theoretical vernacular traits or, <laughs> or individuation of architecture. And I think that uh, there is a continuous problem through architecture, which is basically this centrality of the figure of the architect, which is very male dominated. And again, when we start talking with you, even in Messenger, uh, about the topic of our discussion, I asked and uh, proposed the topic that is actually modernism dead or not? And uh, you said me that uh, maybe somewhere yes, somewhere no. What do you think? Is it actually really a totally dead construct? And do we really still, if not, do we really still have some new modernism today? There are several questions in one, so I'll try yeah. to answer them mm -hmm. all. Um, where, where did like modernism lost or did not lost? I mean, I, I'm not originally special, specialist of architecture and certainly I will, it, it still sounds very much that way. Um, but uh, in our practice at Collective, um, which is very much focused on Central and Eastern Europe, we travel a lot, we visit places, we contrast histories and, uh, and also narratives about architecture and, um, and also contemporary practice about modernist architecture, conservation and preservation. And what we see is are huge differences. Um, in, many, in many places, I, I would say that the battle is raging rather than modernism has lost the battle. The battle is going on, actually. If, and uh, it can be about interwar or postwar modernism. If you look at uh, Bucharest and, uh, and Romania as a whole, um, protecting interwar modernist architecture has become a political trademark. It's about Europeanness. It's about true modernity. It's about sense of common living. It's about sustainability. It's against corruption. It's against politically motivated decision. It's against standardization of taste, you know? And it's a battle which is really, really important important in contemporary uh, Romanian society. If you look at Poland, there I would say that culturally, modernist aesthetics has won. Modernist architecture, perhaps not, because you have also a lot of postmodernism and posterior architecture. Um, and many places are still endangered and being destroyed or even displaced or partially, partially dismantled. But every, for every single one, there is a discussion open. And with regard to the consciousness of younger generation, many people in Poland, in large cities, really relate uh, emotionally to post-war modernist architecture as a symbol of re uh, renovation, rejuvenation, as a symbol of fine architecture, because in many cases, actually, it is a good one. It is good uh, uh, socialist modernism. And uh, it is opposed to um, um, excess of um, um, tradition. It is opposed to uh, a large um, business um, project and real estate pressure over cities. It is uh, opposed to of excess of densification. And these are considered to be places for the youth, actually. Those places built in the 60s are the places for the youth in Poland, not the one built nowadays. And, um, and if you look at Lithuania, for instance, uh, Kaunas and this story about interwar modernism that is uh, expected to be listed on the World Heritage List and that will be core to 2022 uh, European Capital Culture title of Kaunas. Um, it is also a, a good story of how people can emotionally reconnect to a, a modernist principle and architecture. And what is interesting in Kaunas is that after some hesitation, they seem to understand that there is a continuum between 
the planified planned city of the 30s and the planned estate under Soviet time, which are beyond the hills, as they are usually, you know, beyond the center, beyond the hills, beyond the ring. Uh, and that they need to create this continuity for people to fully connect with this architecture and to feel ownership over it as a whole, from the 30s to the 70s, from the estates to the city center. And um, so I, these are just a few examples. And I think Ukraine, I won't quote it because you're best, best play than me, but you will agree that the cultural battle is raging from Kiev to Kharkiv, uh, to Dnepro, <laughs> to, to Lviv or Odessa about conservation of some of fine example of modernist architecture, but also about the problems posed by the poor condition and poor quality of some other. So, and it's much related to your current geopolitical struggle and cultural struggle between West and East, between past and modernity. And uh, I think once in, in an interview you made with my own student, you said that architecture was a kind of a transfer object, like in psychoanalysis and people were putting on it what the topic they could not openly discuss about identity, about nationhood. And, and I think that it is especially true for modernist architecture because modernist architecture is the architecture of the 20th century. And the 20th century is where all our neuroses are, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, I think that uh, another point, another lens that we can uh, look to, for example, protectionist movements uh, against the Moloshian modernist heritage in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in Dnipro, again, in any other cities, is that... I think that it's not like people really want to protect modernist architecture. It's not about, again, style protection or style fence or something like that. It's something, again, about modernism as the style that can represent uh, attempts, some, some trines of architects and society to find the solution of that social and economical and political issues and problems. And when people start fighting against some new developer's project in Kyiv, I think they start, first of all, not to protect even modernist building, but first of all, their human rights and their citizen rights. That is the point. And where we can cross modernism because of that social irritation in projects and uh, nowadays. I completely agree with that. And I think it's also on this psychological level uh, that it can be addressed. Um, architecture, it's people. It's a place where people live, work, grow up, love, you know, make children, create. And, um, and uh, you, you can obviously consider that some architecture is bad, that it is not sustainable, that it is high like it consume a lot of energy and then you can try to adapt it. Sometimes you have to destroy and replace. Uh, you have to put green back in the city. So you have to be able to change. There is no, no question about it. But what you cannot do, it's erase it as a wall, as a style, as a period, as a past that you don't like. Because then when you erase it, you erase, it, you erase all the memories all the stories, all the personal recollection, even the collective history that goes with it. So when you want to take down a modernist building in Kiev because it's Soviet period, um, and to build something that you consider to be reflecting modernity, uh, you are also taking down what goes with this 70 years of history. People who lived, grew up, had children, and so on. And um, that's really very much, as you said, about politics, about governance and bad governance, about corruption. So it's defending your rights, defending also your sense of belonging to a place. And urban planning and architecture ultimately should be about that, about creating a sense of belonging. And this sense of belonging is not always co connected to the quality of the architecture, although quality of architecture helps a lot to create sense of belonging but it's also connected to other things, how places have been used for decades, how they are being used or reconverted now. And that takes me to the second part of your question, which is actually whether um, 
um, modern, we will, there is a new modernism or modernism is dead. Um, here, I will tend to believe that what we need is not new modernism. What we need is not a new Bauhaus. And I don't think it can exist because it's all about condition of production uh, of this style. So we cannot reproduce, hopefully, because they were very specific and not so happy, the condition of production of those architectures. So let's forget about creating a new modernism. And especially, uh, let's forget about pastiche of modernism, you know, which are usually related to a high-end uh, project for wealthy people. No, what I think it's more interesting is the places and the situation in which modernist buildings, whatever the period, whatever the condition, whatever, whoever built them, are reinvented and reappropriated by people. Uh, because they feel this connection to them. So they, they use it as a place for leisure, as a place for fun, as a place for art uh, or for living, uh, but they, re they, they fully integrate it to the popular culture. This is what I think is happening in Poland. This is what is happening in relation to interwar architecture in a few other places, uh, um, in, all throughout Central Eastern Europe, and very specifically in Central Eastern Europe, uh, more than in Western Europe, although there are also a few a few cases. And and I find this interesting, reinventing modernism through different usages, and uh, and uh, emotional appropriation is far more um, and choosing than uh, reinventing modernism as a concept or as an architectural movement. So as for me, I don't think it is that. I think that also uh, environmental challenges will bring us to uh, reconsider those places from a different angle, um, and that there might be, some might be more sustainable than others, but uh, they, they, they might also pass the test of climate change policy and, uh, and uh, destruction maybe is not a good way and uh, we have to move forward and to fully integrate them into our memories and ways of looking at the city around us from Kharkiv to Marseille. <laughs> Thank you. I think we made a great job. And occupy modernism. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> occupy modernism. Uh, yeah, hack modernism. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anya. It was great to, to talk to you again.